going on, guys? Thank you so very much for joining me right here on Off The Script. Today, sponsored by Audible, audibletrial.com slash off the script. 30 days free and one free audio book when you use our link, audibletrial.com slash off the script. This is episode 337, part number two for your Sunday, August 2nd, 2020. Seth Rollins, Seth Rollins, Seth Rollins, man. What a clown. What a clown. It's not even, it's not even a argument anymore that this guy should just absolutely stay away from everything. Interview, panel, social media. In some sense, he should stay away from fucking television. There are a lot of people out there that do not like what he's doing right now. Now, my opinion, I think it's some of the best work that he's done in all of his WWE career. But I really don't get where they're going with it. Seth Rollins was out there, and he recently spoke to Alex McCarthy of TalkSport, and we're going to go over what he said, because he went out there and said two very stupid things, which is going to get him in hot water with the fans, but I'm guessing that's what he wants, because he's a heel. But in my eyes, it makes him look like a bigger clown than he already previously was. Seth Rollins is the top story today, and he's absolutely... Absolutely living the Messiah gimmick. He loves what he's doing. He is the biggest heel outside of Randy Orton on Monday Night Raw. But he sat down with Alex McCarthy of TalkSport and he shit on the fans once again for their criticism of the eye for an eye match at the legitimate horror show known as Extreme Rules when he went one-on-one with Rey Mysterio. He shit on the fans, and he does not like the criticism in regards to the match. I'm sorry, Mr. Rollins. I'm sorry that I can't have an opinion on subpar professional wrestling. Then the other thing that we're going to go over is Seth Rollins talking about the women. Seth Rollins interviewed about, in the same interview, by the way, about what Sasha Banks and Bayley are doing right now on WWE television. And again, you may not like what Bayley and Sasha Banks are doing. You may not like the fact that they own all of the women's championships in WWE, which I don't have a problem with. It's a long time coming, if you ask me. But Seth Rollins said that Sasha Banks and Bayley have been lagging behind Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair for too long now. I'm sorry, is it their choice that they are lagging behind in your obviously shit opinion? Yes, I'm sure Mercedes and Pamela want to be lagging behind Charlotte Flair. Do you think they have any fucking choice as to whether it lag or not lag? I don't really understand that. Now, what does he mean by that? Are they lagging behind as far as in-ring ability? Because I I, I would obviously be sitting here telling you the obvious facts, always. Sasha Banks and Bayley are much better than what Charlotte and Becky do in the ring. That's just my honest opinion. I think Charlotte Flair is incredibly overrated. 12 title reigns means absolutely nothing to me. Becky Lynch, she's very good at what she does. I don't think she's a top-tier level performer in the ring. WWE had to strike while the iron was hot. And if those situations didn't happen and WWE didn't want to book creatively fucking inept storylines when they wanted to turn her heel, we wouldn't have been in this situation with Becky Lynch to begin with. Because then and there they wanted Charlotte Flair. And then they were forced to push Becky Lynch as a babyface because the overwhelming support for her was just too much for them to ignore. And then she got her nose broken and then WWE threw their hands in the air and said, you know what? We don't really want Becky Lynch versus Ronda Rousey at WrestleMania. We wanted Charlotte, but now we're forced to push somebody that we don't want to, but we're going to include Charlotte Flair anyway because she was always our original plan. Do I make sense? Of course I do. Of course I do. But lagging behind Charlotte and Becky, this is what he said. And we're going to go over exactly what he said word for word today on the podcast. The other big thing that we're going to go over today is this Big E situation, which 
It really isn't bothering me, but I love making people look stupid. I love making people look absolutely stupid. There's a lot of people in the community right now that are clamoring for a Big E World Championship run. These people clearly are a detriment to the overall health of the product. They are absolutely mind-numbingly dumb. And they want what they want without any logic behind it. This is why they are known as shills. This is why they are and should be unverified, but they have a blue check mark next to their name. I don't know why these people are fucking verified. I don't even know why the fuck these people have an audience, to be honest with you. They spew such bullshit. They spew bullshit and you listen to it. Hook, line, and sinker. Big E is great. I love Big E. Big E, Xavier, and Kofi, when serious, you know, it is very difficult to find anybody better at what they do. I've said that time and time and time again. I am not a fan of the unicorns. I'm not a fan of the antics. I'm not a fan of the gyrating. I'm not a fan of the fucking pancakes, which they can't do right now because of COVID. Nobody wants to touch fucking food handled by somebody else and thrown into the crowd. So they had to do away with that gimmick. But... Big E should have had a singles run before everybody else in the New Day. It was just Kofi that they put into that situation last year because he fit the mold of what was going on more so. They wanted somebody to replace Mustafa Ali last year, and Kofi was the closest one to do that. He was the closest to emulate what Mustafa Ali does. So Ali got hurt. In comes Kofi Kingston. And then he ran with it. He made his own opportunity. Nobody expected. WWE didn't expect Kofi to come out of that. Oh my God, we got to give this guy a championship match. He proved to them that he belonged there. But no matter how good you think Kofi Kingston did last year on his way to a WWE championship run, it should have been Big E. We should have been talking about Big E winning the WWE championship out of everybody in the New Day. And now he's finally getting that opportunity because Kofi Kingston is quote-unquote hurt. I don't know if he's legitimately hurt. I don't know if WWE is just pushing this as one of their agendas or trying to write their own narrative now with the world climate and in comes Big E. I don't know. I would not be surprised if that is the case. But there is a time and a place for everything. And right now in 2020 is not the time and the place per storyline for Big E to become a world champion or even challenge for a world championship. Not when you got Bray Wyatt about to take the title of Braun Strowman. Not when you overwhelmingly have the aspect of Roman Reigns any month now coming back to WWE programming. Because you know they want him. Unless he stays out all year, which I can't see. Big E should not be in title contention at all. What you got to do with Big E is very simple. Very simple. And we're going to go over that today because Booker T said something that I absolutely agree with. Booker T said that Big E needs to shed some of the New Day gimmick if they want or if the people are going to take him seriously. Or if he, you know, is in that boat, he said he would rather see Big E shed all that so that he can take him seriously. And I absolutely agree with that. Xavier Woods, obviously, in defense of both of his brothers, Kofi Kingston and Big E, said something to Booker T. We're going to go over that. And the other big story today is what Ember Moon said, which I found very, very interesting. Ember Moon was not a fan of Sasha Banks winning the Raw Women's Championship on Monday night. And she's not a fan of the two-woman power trip right now in WWE with Bayley and Sasha Banks. I don't know why. I do think that this is going to be much better for the overall health of the women's division. But she may not see that right now sitting at home rehabilitating, watching this garbage on television. She watches and sees what we see. So I know that Ember Moon means well. But I don't think she fully grasps, grasps what Sasha Banks and Bailey are trying to do with their two-woman power trip which is inevitably going to lead up to their breakup. So we're going to go over what Ember Moon said. She isn't a fan of Sasha and Bayley holding all the women's championships in WWE. And I got other news, including ratings, AEW NXT ratings, SmackDown ratings. Kyrie Sane took major criticism 
for the timing of her goodbye tweet following her beatdown on Monday Night Raw, updates on Rey Mysterio and Dominic going into SummerSlam, and what happened to the new nation of domination. Are we getting it? Or is MVP even against reviving the group on Monday Night Raw? Loaded show here, guys. Thank you so much for joining me, as always. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for all notifications. If you missed any of the content that I've uploaded this week, Monday Night Raw, AEW, there was no NXT live review. There will be an NXT review next week, so look forward to that. I did not cover NXT this week because I was exhausted from my vacation. I wanted to just relax and recoup and make sure I attack the weekend, which was more important to me anyway. But if you missed anything that I've uploaded, including some extras, I got some extras already lined up for next week as well. So we got a lot of content coming, so make sure you are here for all of it. Hit that subscribe button and turn on that bell for all notifications. Follow me on social media, both on Twitter and Instagram. JD from NY206 is the Twitter and Instagram handle. Go and check that out, and thank you for following me on the medias. If you guys want to support the podcast via Patreon, you guys can certainly do that as well. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. You guys know Audible sponsoring the show, so make sure you go and get your free audiobook and 30 days of the service, which is great. You guys can cancel at any time and still get to keep your audiobook for free. And then Monday, Monday afternoon, the new shirt goes on sale, noon Eastern, bonfire exclusively. If you guys love the original design, which was probably the number one selling off the script t-shirt, it's probably a very, very, very close tie between the Negan original design and the JD's Elite design that exclusively went live on bonfire last year if you guys want to go and get this man it will be on sale noon eastern the new and updated 2020 version of the off the script classic t-shirt jd is negan this time in 2020 with all the shills and all the blue check marks that just make you nauseous every single week every single monday night every single friday night it's downright nauseating. I am the YWC slash IWC savior. And the new and improved JD's Negan shirt is going on sale. Bonfire.com tomorrow at noon. Make sure you guys keep an eye on my medias on Twitter, on Instagram. The link will go live right at 12 noon. Pick it up. I would really appreciate it. Every shirt that is sold helps out the show grow. It helps out the show advance and get better every single year, man. So thank you guys so very much and go and get your t-shirts today. Bonfire exclusively. They are the best. The quality is great. And I can't wait for you guys to pick up that shirt. It's going to be awesome. Let's hit the top, man. We're going to talk about Seth Rollins. I know you guys, a lot of people have asked me about my opinion on this. Seth Rollins addressing the criticism of the eye for an eye match at the legitimate horror show. That was Extreme Rules. Now, Seth Rollins said that Vince McMahon wasn't as hands-on as people think he was, which is complete bullshit. Which is complete bullshit. Rollins immediately is lying right out of the gate in this interview, so I don't know why anybody would listen to this or read this and take him seriously. Vince McMahon wasn't as hands-on as people think? Are you fucking serious? Are you serious? So I'm supposed to believe that Vince McMahon just let you guys do what you wanted to do and you came up with what you thought was best and Vince McMahon didn't have any say in anything, right? When all the reports that I read said Vince McMahon was personally responsible for the choice of weapons used in this. That Vince McMahon was responsible for the fact of the matter that WWE goes with a CGI ending or not. And that the eyeball that we seen pop out of Rey Mysterio's head and I used pop out of his head loosely was Vince McMahon's idea because he didn't like the original ending with the CGI. So Seth Rollins is trying to convince us, the reader or the listener, that Vince McMahon wasn't responsible for anything in that match. He wasn't as hands-on as people think he was. Then who the fuck was? Who the fuck was? The eye for an eye match between Rey Mysterio and Seth Rollins had mixed reviews. Deservedly so, because the match itself was fine. The ending was fucking terrible. It was ridiculous. Some people praised the match quality presented by WWE, while most were critical of the finish of the match, which, again, 
falls in line with what I just said. My opinion was probably the majority opinion on the match and the finish. Rollins beat Mysterio in the match at Extreme Rules, and it happened when Rollins pushed Mysterio's eye into the side of the steel step. Now, I don't really understand how you push somebody's eyeball into the steel step and then it pops out. You know, I thought that the ruling of the match was the eye was to be extracted. So WWE defied logic by pushing the eyeball back in Mysterio's head and all of a sudden just popped out. And then he goes to puke in the corner, which was, I'm sure, but Rollins doesn't seem to think so. Vince McMahon had Seth Rollins puke in the corner, which was actually more disturbing than Mysterio's eyeball popping out. But I'm sure Rollins was all for the puking and Vince McMahon had nothing to do with that shit. So Rollins beat Mysterio, pushed his eye into the side of the steel, of the steel step, and they used a fake eye that obviously went viral on social media immediately when the match had come to an end. Now, Rollins spoke to Alex McCarthy of TalkSport about the match. Rollins started out by saying that he didn't expect this to be the type of match leading up to it, and he was caught off guard and didn't even really know how to prepare for it. So he's already contradicting himself. So he just said that Vince McMahon wasn't as hands-on as people think. Now, you might be thinking about the actual match. He wasn't hands-on with the match. But then he says... He did not expect this to be the type of match leading up to it and was caught off guard and they didn't know how to prepare for it. So if Vince McMahon didn't have a say as much as people read from The Observer, then why are you out here saying that you didn't expect it to be this type of match? Who made that decision to go in this direction? Was it you? Was it Rey Mysterio? Was it Buddy Murphy? Maybe Buddy Murphy has a hand in creative on Monday Night Raw that we don't know of. Was it Dominic? Was it Dominic Mysterio who opted to take this storyline in the direction that it went? Or was it Vince McMahon, clown? You didn't expect it to be what it was. So how the fuck did you get there? One way in and one way only. It's a one-way fucking trip. One-way ticket on this flight, and that's Vince McMahon Airlines. He recalled watching the first blood matches because that was the only match type that he could understand that this was almost as similar to that. And this type of match had not been done before in WWE. He says, and I quote, at the end of the day, was it ideal? No. No. Did it catch people's attention? Sure. It ended up on TMZ. So, Rollins, with his overall stance and stature in the company, when you hear reports of Becky Lynch pitching what she wants to do with Shayna Baszler being turned down, more than likely Sasha Banks and Bailey are pitching ideas to Vince McMahon about how they want their feud to end up because we don't really know how many more times in this generation we're going to Sasha Banks and Bailey storyline. This is pretty much it for those two ladies. How many more times can you go back to the well? You go back once too often, it ain't going to be all that exciting anymore. So you know for a fact, and I would be a betting man, that Mercedes and Pamela, Sasha and Bailey, are both giving... Vince McMahon, some direction as far as where they want to go. It might not end up exactly like Sasha and Bailey want. It might not be the exact direction they want, but the end result might be the same as what they envision. And then you got Daniel Bryan. I don't know if you guys read this report or heard this coming out of SmackDown. Daniel Bryan has been a prominent figure on the creative team on SmackDown for weeks now. The reason why we got the fatal four-way that we got with Gren Metalik and Lindsay Dorado, Chad Gable, guys like that, Drew Gulak, is Daniel Bryan. The reason why the Lucha House Party are going into SummerSlam for the Tag Team Championships against Cesaro and Nakamura is because of Daniel Bryan. The reason why you're seeing guys on SmackDown who have been underutilized for far too long Owned to utilize, not been used, is because of Daniel Bryan. So, Daniel Bryan, Sasha and Bailey, 
and Becky Lynch, all respectable names of great stature in the WWE. You mean to tell me that Seth Rollins is the quiet mouse sitting in the corner, not giving any direction for his match or his feud or what happens to him on Monday Night Raw to anybody in creative, not to Bruce, not to Vince? All you give a shit about is being on TMZ. Yes, the ending sucked, but we made TMZ. People were interested. People had an interest in it. So that line in itself, at the end of the day, was it ideal? No. Did it catch people's attention? Sure, it ended up on TMZ. So you're okay with it as long as you end up on TMZ. No matter if it's shit or if it's great, if it's epic, if it's going to be something that people fucking live through the annals of WWE history forever and ever. If it gets on TMZ, you're okay with it. Match sucked as long as it's on TMZ, I'm good. You mean to tell me that this guy doesn't have any say in what, what, what happens here, what goes on with his storylines? That sounds like a WWE shill-like response. It really does. He noted that when they accomplished what they needed to do, which was to tell a very interesting story and was able to gain interest from outside of the WWE bubble, even though it was a weird finish, he says this, and I quote, if you like the lake of reincarnation in AEW, but you hate the eye for an eye match, do you know what I mean? Then where are we really at here? Uh, No, clown, I don't know what you mean because I don't remember ever seeing the lake of fucking reincarnation in AEW. I remember seeing it in Impact. I remember seeing it on WWE television. I don't remember seeing it in AEW. And by the way, how is Matt Hardy changing fucking character similar to Rey Mysterio's eyeball popping out of his fucking head? I don't understand that comparison. So I'd love for him to elaborate on that. Did Alex McCarthy say anything in in, in rebuttal to that? Of course not. He's just happy Rollins is on his fucking show. Does it make sense as far as a comparison goes? Do you know what I mean? No, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. If you like the lake of reincarnation, but you hate an eye for an eye match... You can't even make a comparison. Why do people love Matt Hardy? Because he's entertaining. People know Matt Hardy for being that type of gimmick. People appreciate what he does and the levels of dedication he takes into the character. Matt Hardy was beloved when that character and that gimmick was reaching the heights that it did. Guy went to the fucking supermarket acting broken. He went to the goddamn supermarket doing errands, broken. Guy roamed around his fucking house, speaking that way. He gave a name to a fucking rowboat, for Christ's sakes. He made the entire lake behind his house into a gimmick of its own. That's what I call creative. That's what I call creative. We know Matt Hardy isn't really that. We know Matt Hardy isn't really that, but we love what he does because of his creativity. So when Matt Hardy dips in from version two Matt, big money Matt, broken Matt, you know, early day Matt Hardy Matt, we know that it's for entertainment purposes and we know he's not really transforming himself. It's pro wrestling. Just like when we grew older and we watched The Undertaker raise up from the fucking dead. And he shoots lightning from the fucking ceiling of the arena and burns everything in the ring. We know he's not really doing that. Why did people hate this match? Because it's not pro wrestling. That's why. You got two different avenues of pro wrestling. Matt Hardy, Undertaker, like pro wrestling gimmicks, right? And then you got the guys like Tommaso Ciampa, Johnny Gargano, Adam Cole, who just love to go out there and wrestle. Wrestle. And then you got this. Why did people hate this? Because nobody believed going in that Rollins would lose an eyeball, being that he's a full-time WWE performer. Nobody thought that Rey Mysterio was going to lose his eyeball, whether he stayed with the WWE or not. How ridiculous do you 
take people to be. Unless you were going to re redo your entire gimmick and come out as fucking pegged like Pirate Rollins, Johnny Depp Rollins, right, with a fucking hook for a hand. Give me a break. Nobody believed anybody was losing a fucking eyeball. But you wanted everybody to believe, and they laughed at you. But you made TMZ. So what did WWE do here? Did they want to tell genuinely a good story? Or did WWE just want the publicity that TMZ gives this type of shit? And they wanted the spotlight, and they want the people to talk about it instead of telling a good, actual, genuine story with logic, and that makes sense. So he wants to know why people are being critical of this match and the match finish. I don't know what else I could possibly tell you. Nobody believed. Nobody believed. So that is every reason for people to shit on the match. What if AEW signed Rey Mysterio and he didn't re-sign with the WWE after having this match? Well, what's gonna How ridiculous would you look? How ridiculous would WWE look if he lost his eye here and then did not sign with the WWE, went over to AEW, for example, challenged Cody Rhodes for the TNT Championship, and he's got both of his eyeballs. I don't know why you don't think that doesn't sound ridiculous or look ridiculous. No, but you want people to just open up because if you like the Lake of Reincarnation, you'd like this. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. There have been reports about Vince McMahon playing a role in the layout of the match and making the final decision of the match. He says this, does Rollins, and I quote, a lot of the time Vince says, here's what we want to do, and he gives us the ball and lets us figure out how to take it to the end zone. Does that happen with everybody? Man, that is a very, very vague statement by Seth Rollins. Now, if he's giving you leeway in something like this to that extent, and you just got done saying, was it ideal? Was it ideal? What did he say? Was it ideal at the end of the day? No. And then he started out by saying earlier in the interview that he didn't expect this to be the direction of which the storyline was going. He didn't expect this type of match leading up to the finale of Rey Mysterio and Seth Rollins. So if Vince McMahon is giving these guys the ball and letting them take it to the end zone, why don't you have it in you to tell Vince, Vince, this doesn't work. This doesn't make sense. And list the reasons why. Why is the internet listing reasons why this doesn't make sense? But you can't do that. But Vince McMahon's giving you the ball. If he's giving you the ball, then fucking take it to the coach and tell him that the play isn't what we need. This play's not going to work. You want me to run the ball here? I think it's better we pass it. I don't think we should be stealing second base here. It's too late in the game. We don't need to take a risk like that. We got our cleanup hitter up at the plate. Let him fucking hit it out of the park. Yet yeah, I'm supposed to take this guy and everything he says seriously. So he continued by noting that the idea was presented to him and he was against it as it came off ridiculous and a bit of a joke. However, as time went on, he thought it would be different and it could be good. So he did think that it was a bad idea. So again, as time went on, who convinced him that this was the direction that they needed to go? Was it Seth Rollins? Normally when one's intuition says something is bad right from the get-go, more than likely you should listen to your own intuition. I would not be surprised if somebody in creative, Bruce or Vince or somebody that tickles Vince McMahon's balls, convinced this guy that this was going to be good. It's going to be on TMZ, pal. It's going to be in the, in the public limelight, pal. I want you to vomit in the corner, pal. Are you fucking serious? So you didn't like it from stage one, but you went ahead and did it anyway knowing that the criticism was always going to be there. 
You should have weighed your pros and cons there, Clonlins. Clearly you didn't. Clearly you succumbed to WWE's shitty creative. I thought you were bigger and better than that. You're supposed to be the face of Monday Night Raw. Not in my eyes. Not in my eyes. You're the Messiah. Every decision should end with you, apparently. But you went ahead and made another wrong decision. So Vince, he says, wasn't as hands-on as people would like to think he was. If I'm going to break the fourth wall here, so to speak, it was really 99% myself, Ray, and Jamie Noble. At the end of the day, you had Vince who made the final call on what the last shot was going to look like, and that's pretty much it. There were a couple of versions of what the final shot would look like, and we went with the one that we thought made the most sense. It was a joint decision on everyone's behalf. Rollins added that it was a product that he was pretty proud of the first time, and he was able to wrestle Rey Mysterio for an extended period of time, so he was not upset about it one bit. I don't believe anything this guy says. I really don't. You, you mean to tell me that Vince wasn't as hands-on as people think or said or reported earlier before all this interview came out? Vince McMahon has his hands in literally every aspect of WWE. If you think Vince McMahon is just going to give probably the biggest storyline outside of Edge and Randy Orton, which is not even happening right now, on Monday Night Raw to you and Ray and Jamie Noble without having any say. Vince McMahon had a 0.0.1% hands-on approach to this match. You are absolutely fucking mental. You are absolutely fucking mental if you think Vince McMahon didn't have a full hands-on approach to this match. What happened, how the match was laid out, what weapons were in the match, and the ending that we've seen which was not the original ending, which was confirmed by Rollins. Absolutely ridiculous. Rollins just comes off as bitter. Rollins comes off like a crybaby. Oh, you didn't like what I did? Why are you complaining? Why don't you stop watching the show? Rollins comes off like a crybaby, but I'm here to tell everybody how ridiculous he looks. This is why I guess I'm blocked on social media. Rollins is a clown. That was not the only thing he talked about with Alex McCarthy. Rollins says, Sasha Banks and Bailey have been lagging behind Charlotte and Becky for far too long. In the same interview, he says this, and I quote, I think it's no secret that Bailey and Sasha Banks have done their goddamnedest to fill in for Becky being out and the women's division just being wide open right now. Charlotte Flair being out now, too. The women have been lagging behind Becky and Charlotte for some time now, and it's time for them to step up and do their thing. Asuka has stepped up, too, as well. But I do think Bailey and Sasha have been great. They've filled that void as best they possibly can and have been working like crazy as tag team champs and now Raw and SmackDown as tag team champions and Raw and Women's Champion. The duo known as the Golden Role Models currently hold all the gold in WWE, and they are on their way to having probably their biggest storyline yet. Bayley is the current SmackDown Women's Champion. Sasha is the current Raw Women's Champion, while both superstars hold the Women's Tag Team Championships as well. Seth Rollins' comments come during the rise of both female superstars in the wake of Becky and Charlotte's absence from WWE. Lynch, who is obviously engaged to Seth Rollins, announced that the couple were expecting a child together and she's been on maternity leave from WWE. Charlotte Flair has been absent with elective surgery, which she just revealed new pictures of herself on her Instagram. If you guys want to go and check that out, nothing looks changed or different to me. Charlotte has been absent from WWE since being written off television on June 22nd, 2020, During Monday Night Raw, during that episode, Charlotte would be viciously attacked by Nia Jax backstage, forcing Flair to be sidelined with an injury indefinitely, quote-unquote. So, he says that they've been lagging behind Charlotte and Becky for far too long now. Now, why is that? Why is that? Is, Is it a situation where 
Sasha and Bailey really want to be behind Charlotte and Becky Lynch? I don't think so. So you say that they're lagging behind Charlotte, but is it their choice to be lagging? First of all, it's your opinion, number one. Obviously, you're going to be sticking up for your wife. I get it. Everybody in the company sticks up for Charlotte Flair. That's a foregone conclusion. Sasha and Bailey have not been the uh, sparkle in everybody's eye in management since they got called up from NXT. They've been there. They've been a part of the evolution. But if WWE was to rewrite the evolution, it would not be Sasha and Bailey. If WWE was to rewrite the evolution, it would be Charlotte Flair and nobody else. Simple, simple. Simple fucking physics here, folks. There's nothing of a surprise there with that statement. You know it, I know it, everybody fucking knows it. But is it really Sasha and Bailey and their choice to be lagging, quote unquote, behind Charlotte and Becky when everybody is on TV? No. WWE pushes Charlotte more so than anybody because of who she is. WWE pushes Charlotte because she is the apple of everyone's eye, both body type, both name and stature in the business. That's the reason why she is where she is. If she comes out and says no, or if Triple H comes out and refutes rumors and all this other shit, that she works hard and blah, 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 it's only deflecting the truth that everybody knows is there. They don't want you to know that. So they're going to they're gonna do everything to cover up exactly what everybody knows about Charlotte Flair. Becky Lynch? Of course he's going to speak highly of Becky Lynch. She's having his child. So no matter who it is, they're going to be lagging behind Becky Lynch because Becky Lynch is the wife of Seth Rollins. No surprise there. Now, did everybody take a liking to Sasha and Bayley? Who knows what people thought about when Sasha walked out of WWE? There were people on the roster that thought very low of her. There were some people on the roster that hoped she never came back. There were some people on the roster that thought she was a problem child in the locker room. So how much of this is Seth Rollins speaking about Sasha and Bayley being a shoot? And how much of it is just him being a dick because of who Charlotte is in the company and who Becky Lynch is in relations to him? Yes, it's their choice that they want to be lagging behind. They've lagged behind so long because of who Charlotte is. WWE will not stop until they get Charlotte to be the greatest female performer in the history of the company with no one else ever being second No one. They want no one near Charlotte. Ever. Sasha and Bailey are only in the position that they are in right now because of Becky and Charlotte being off TV. They're not lagging behind. They're lagging behind because WWE has favorites. They're lagging behind because there's a political push and an agenda in WWE to push who they want. Not to push who needs to be pushed. Otherwise, we'd see a flourishing division, which right now we don't. Sasha and Bayley, believe it or not, to the sadness of you listening to me, they're only in the position that they are in right now because there are no other horsewomen in the equation. WWE had Charlotte and Becky go out. They had Sasha and Bayley to kind of backpack WWE with. If Sasha and Bailey are doing what they're doing now, do you really believe that they would still be doing what they're doing now if Becky and Charlotte are on TV? We wouldn't even have this storyline. This thing is obviously being written week by week by week. It's progressing week by week by week. There's no way they'd be in the position that they're in right now if Charlotte did not go away and Becky was on television as Raw Women's Champion. Becky would still be the Raw Women's Champion right now. It's not their choice to be lagging. It's not their choice to be in the position that they're in right now. WWE relied on them to get them to a point with the women's division, and that's exactly what they're doing. If Sasha and Bayley and Charlotte and Becky were all on TV, WWE would be relying on Becky and Charlotte to lead them on TV and not Sasha and Bayley. 
We probably would have gotten Sasha and Bailey at SummerSlam, and it would have been a second-rate match. It wouldn't have been the main event. So it's not their choice to be lagging behind. It's not your stance to say that they're lagging behind. They need to catch up. In a lot of people's eyes, they were already the front runners of this entire division. And how could Sasha and Bailey ever be lagging behind when they are the exact reason why the entire division and revolution is in WWE to begin with? How could you be lagging behind when you will forever be known as the leaders of the evolution? Seth Rollins is an absolute clown. He is an absolute clown. Sasha Banks, speaking of Sasha Banks, she was originally not planned to win the Raw Women's Championship. The original plan at Extreme Rules was for Asuka to retain the Raw Women's Championship, but earlier in the day, before the pay-per-view, the decision was made to stretch out the match so they could do it a week later on Raw. The match was taped last week, The booking was changed to have Sasha Banks win the title this week, but the original plan was to have Asuka go to SummerSlam as the champion so she could defend the title against Shayna Baszler. Meltzer said, and I quote, there were so many changes made, including the Asuka and Sasha Banks stuff, that was all changed. Originally, Asuka was going to defend the title against whoever injured Kyrie, and that was it. That was the plan, at least, of Sunday night or Monday morning, right before the tapings, and they ended up tearing up both scripts. That was that. That was the situation there. Now, I don't know where we go here into SummerSlam. Asuka, Asuka is more than likely going to get another rematch against Sasha Banks at SummerSlam. Where does that leave Bailey? I don't know. I don't really know. Stephanie McMahon has been teasing shit with Bailey, and Bailey has been teasing right back with Stephanie McMahon. They come on TV and say that they they run WWE, they own WWE. None of the none of the McMahons outside of Stephanie are going to be able to do anything in the ring to teach Bailey a lesson, to teach Sasha a lesson. So if Sasha and Oscar have a match. At SummerSlam, which would fit right into the narrative here because Bailey took out Kyrie Sane. It was the golden role models who got one over on Asuka by going to attack Kyrie. And that led Asuka, like an idiot, to leave a title match to go save her best friend. I would have said, fuck my best friend. The title's on the line. So more than likely, because of their actions, Asuka's going to get another match. And Stephanie's probably going to be the one to facilitate all of that. And in return, Bailey's going to take issue with Stephanie. And Stephanie and Bailey are going to have a one on one match at SummerSlam. That's my opinion on that. A lot of people were saying maybe Bailey and Bailey and Asuka at SummerSlam. But then where does that leave Sasha Banks? Doesn't really play into the overall storyline. Sasha Banks doesn't really have anybody. Now, that could happen. I could see WWE doing some willy-nilly shit. I would not be surprised if they do go with Bailey versus Asuka because Bailey was the one that took out Kyrie, and now Asuka wants Bailey. You could make a situation out of that. Who does Sasha Banks defend the title against at SummerSlam? You could put Bianca Belair in there, even though it wouldn't make any fucking sense whatsoever. That's a SummerSlam match in name. That's a SummerSlam match in headline right there. Sasha Banks, Bianca Belair... Raw Women's Championship. It deserves more than two weeks to tell the story, but I could see WWE doing that if they want to go that route and Stephanie isn't really factored into the plans. Asuka versus Bailey, Sasha versus Bianca. What if? What if that is the case and Bailey loses the championship to Asuka? What if? Now, I've been clamoring for merging divisions and eliminating titles because I think there's way too many titles on WWE TV. The tag team titles in the men's division needs to be joined together. We need to merge those divisions. The divisions on Raw and SmackDown are fucking absolutely ridiculous. It's downright comical at this point. You don't need two tag team championships. You don't need two divisions. You don't even have teams on one side, teams on the other to even constitute as divisions. 
So I don't know why you wouldn't explore that option. It would make the shows a lot more watchable. And it would make the divisions a lot more competitive. What if Bailey loses the title to Asuka? Asuka beats Bailey, gets a level of revenge against Bailey, takes the title into another match with Sasha because she wants to teach Sasha a lesson as well. And we get a merging of the divisions. We get a unification match with Sasha and Asuka for the WWE Women's Championship. It's not the Raw Women's Championship anymore. It's not the SmackDown Women's Championship anymore. It's the WWE Women's Heavyweight Championship. That could be a possibility. That could be a fun storyline situation to explore. When does that happen? Could happen at Night of Champions, Clash of Champions, whatever the fuck they want to call it. It could happen at Hell in a Cell. I don't see them doing Hell in a Cell in the Performance Center, but either way, I like the idea. I like that concept. Because I've been saying for years that both tag team divisions in the men's division on Raw and SmackDown need to be merged. I've been saying for years that the women's division on both Raw and SmackDown need to be merged. No draft or shakeup will save these divisions because all you're doing is keeping the same number of women on both shows and all you're doing is making the divisions look different by name. You're not giving the divisions depth. You're not giving the divisions a competitive feel. That could be a situation. How we get there, that's exactly how we would get there. Now, it all hinges on, on if, if Stephanie McMahon is going to wrestle or not. I don't want that, but it certainly looks to be the case. And it fits into the storyline. You can make sense of both situations. But Monday Night Raw was not originally planned to have Sasha Banks win the Raw Women's Championship. I didn't like that ending. I didn't like that Kyrie saying beat down attack. I didn't like the way it was presented. I didn't like the way it was portrayed. They could have went about it a little bit more as far as paying attention to detail. Could have went about it in a more logical way. Who threw up that scene in the back? Who hit the button to show what was going on there? Why was there a camera crew already on site to watch Bailey and Kyrie Sane get into a beat down attack on Monday Night Raw? It would have made so much more sense for Bailey to bully a fucking cameraman, drag a cameraman back there, show everybody Kyrie saying laying on the floor, continue to beat her down, have Asuka do what she did. It would have looked so much better than just somebody hitting a button and showing the beat down on the back. And Kyrie saying, this is the other point I brought up on Monday. Kyrie saying beat Bailey in a one on one situation, yet she can't handle Bailey here in the back. I don't really understand that. So one night you took care of Bailey, but on this night you can't even muster any offense against Bailey whatsoever. And then Asuka. How stupid does Asuka look? You just got your championship stolen from Sasha Banks, and you should be in the mindset of doing anything to keep that championship. Yet because of what happened in the back, you left Sasha in the ring by herself, knowing that if you lose on count out, you lose the championship. And you said, fuck the championship to go help your best friend. Now, I know if I'm Kyrie saying, I'm telling Asuka, don't worry about me. I'm going to live. You win the championship. I just didn't like anything that was presented there. It looked silly. The outcome of Sasha being the Royal Women's Champion, I have no problem with. I think it's going to be great. But I do think the way that they went about it could have been tightened up a little bit better. Now, Ember Moon is not a fan of of Sasha Banks and Bayley holding all of the women's championships in WWE. Ember Moon saw all this down, or, or saw all this go down at home, but she might not be a big fan of what had happened. She was on Twitch, and Moon questioned why WWE needs two double champions in the women's division. She said, if they're going to do a low-key evolution with Banks and Bayley wrestling for the top titles, and reliving the two-man power trip, she says this, and I quote, Why do we need two double champions? Is SummerSlam going to be a low-key evolution with Sasha and Bayley wrestling for their singles titles and also for the tag team titles? Is that a thing? Are we just reliving Triple H and Steve Austin two-man power trip from 2001? 
Sasha and Bailey have done a great job with a limited roster, but there are too many people sitting at home to tie up all of the championships with just two people. I was kind of ups- upset. The match was superb. I don't like the fact that knowing it was Kyrie's last appearance, I don't know if that's the way you go. I feel you make it more of a threat than just Kyrie saying getting beat up backstage. I think you have Bailey beat up Kyrie and then have her with a forklift about to drop some cinder blocks, for example. Asuka had Sasha in the Asuka lock. All she had to do was sit back. It makes more sense if Kyrie is in more of a life or death situation versus her getting thrown into stuff and stomped. This is exactly what I just said, folks. When my thought process and my mentality lines up with an actual performer there working for the company, you know the things that I complain about have some level of credence here. I don't complain for the sake of complaining. How stupid does it look for Asuka to go back there when all Kyrie's saying is, Having done to her is, oh, let me throw her into the steel garage. Let me throw her into some production crates. Let me put the boots to her. She's not dying. She's not over there risking her fucking life in this attack by Bailey. But Asuka left the championship match for a minor beatdown. Kyrie took more of a beatdown in the match against Bailey in the ring the week before than she did in that beatdown attack last week. I don't understand this. So Ember Moon is giving what I thought and what a lot of people thought some credibility there. It makes more sense if Kyrie is in a life or death situation versus her getting thrown into stuff and stomped. I get we're supposed to be angry and kudos to them for making us angry. No one wanted Asuka to lose. Everyone wanted NXT Asuka back and having an undefeated streak. That's what WWE does. I fell for the ploy of I'm angry because I saw my friend Asuka lose the title in a crappy way. Are we going to have Sasha just lose the title to Lacey Evans or transfer the title over to Naomi? They're building to SummerSlam, right? As a fan, I feel like I got ripped off because once again, I don't get Bailey versus Sasha. End quote. Ember Moon seems to be trying to make sense of what we're seeing, but also she seems to be crying because she's not getting what she wants in a Bailey versus Sasha match at SummerSlam. She's trying to make sense of it because she, just like everybody else, is wondering, well, if this is the case, who do they defend the championships against? She's all right. She's automatically in the mindset of you're tying both championships up at SummerSlam. You're not giving me Sasha and Bailey. So what are you going to do with the championships that you're tying both championships up on both of these women? How is that going to make the division better? I just gave you. I just gave you a situation, two situations to be exact with Stephanie. Because she's already shown face once in this storyline. And Asuka. Asuka. Asuka and Bailey for the SmackDown Women's Championship, which WWE would have to make sense of because Asuka is not a SmackDown superstar to challenge for a SmackDown title. But I guess Sasha Banks is not a Raw superstar, so what makes it logical that she's challenging for a Raw championship when she's a SmackDown superstar? WWE, there's a lot that doesn't make sense here. But I think the end goal is what everybody is really thinking about in a very linear fashion. They're not thinking about, oh, this doesn't make sense or that doesn't make sense. They're not thinking, oh, Sasha's a SmackDown superstar. Why is she over here? Or the possibility of Asuka challenging Bayley. Well, she can't do that because she's a Raw superstar and Bayley's a SmackDown superstar. I don't know what happens here, but I guess this is the fun of it. I do think that Ember Moon is coming off exactly how I say she is. I do think that she's trying to make sense of it like we all are, but she's also crying and complaining because she's not getting a Bailey versus Sasha Banks match for the title at SummerSlam like everybody thought this feud was going to end up with. Not yet. They're waiting for something in particular. I know that for sure. They want to see what WWE does as far as live fan interaction and live audience. Whether it happens at SummerSlam in some capacity, whether it's at Survivor Series, whether it happens later in the year, in some capacity. When we get, if we get, I should say, because when, we're not getting. 
If it happens, that's what they're waiting for. And if they don't get it, then they'll go ahead and just kind of do what they need to do to close off this storyline. But I do think Sasha and Bayley holding all the championships are going to be a situation where it's better off for the overall health of the division. Because if they are at the top of their game and they are the two-man power trip that even Ember Moon is saying that they are. And a lot of people are making it out to be a Stone Cold Steve Austin and Triple H situation. You know for a fact that whoever takes them down because of the status that they have right now in the company, whoever takes that Raw Women's Championship off of Sasha Banks, whoever takes that SmackDown Women's Championship off of Bayley, whoever takes those tag team championships off of Sasha and Bayley will be better off for it. Do you not think that Sasha and Bayley are thinking about the overall health of the division? Do you honestly feel like they are doing this because they have the same mentality as Charlotte Flair? Charlotte Flair would put herself in a position in this very same instance and not want a job to anybody else. She would not want to see the overall health of the division thrive. She wouldn't want to put anybody over. She wouldn't want to drop the titles to anybody. She wouldn't sell for anybody. This is the fact. All you have to do is watch the show to see how that woman has operated over the last five years. Do you genuinely feel and honestly think that Sasha and Bailey gave themselves this storyline, have been pitching ideas for this storyline to only give themselves the championships and say, fuck the division? Or do you think they have the mindset of, we're going to give ourselves all the championships and then we're going to spread the wealth because of where we are on top of the pecking order? You know, I don't know if you guys remember. The Ryan Satan story was fucking fu full of shit. Nobody cried. Nobody threw a hissy fit backstage. Obviously, if you watch the show, you know why that woman left the WWE following WrestleMania. It's not that difficult to figure out. They were the only two women. They were the only two women to come out close to midnight to watch Ronda, Becky, and Charlotte in the main event. They were out there in attendance, watching the match live in the arena. They were not in the back watching it on a TV. They were not with the rest of the locker room watching it in the locker room. They didn't leave the arena early to go watch it on their hotel TVs. They were there in the arena. The only two women in that arena from the locker room out there to support. Why? Because without them, they wouldn't be watching. Nobody would be watching what we're watching on that night with Becky, Rhonda, and Charlotte. They were so proud of what they started and where it ended up in that moment that they wanted to be out there personally to watch. Alexa wasn't out there. Lacey wasn't out there. The Iconics weren't out there. Dana Brooke wasn't out there. Naomi wasn't out there. Tamina wasn't out there. Nia Jax wasn't out there. Carmella wasn't out there. Every woman on that roster at that time was not out there. Sasha and Bailey were. Do you honestly think these women gave themselves the situation that they're in right now to not spread the wealth? This is classic pro wrestling storyline 101, folks. The higher you are in the pecking order and the more dominant you are in the pecking order and the bigger the heel you are in the pecking order, the one who beats you is going to be more over for it. The one that beats you is going to be more over for it. So who's going to take the title off Sasha? I don't know. But I know for a fact that when Sasha gets what's coming to her pro wrestling wise, the one who's in the ring with her is going to be a bigger deal because of it. Look at the reign that Bailey has had and the run she's had as a heel on SmackDown. You don't think the woman that's in the ring with her on that night when she wins that championship is going to be better off for it? The way that they've handled the tag team championship situation in WWE has been terrible. The fact that they're even on Sasha and Bayley is miraculous in itself. They look good just being on them because of what they are to the show right now. And even that championship, when it goes to someone else, will be better off for it. This is exactly what they are thinking and envisioning with this storyline. 
At the end of the day, we might not even get Sasha versus Bayley for the championships because at this point, in my honest opinion, I don't even think they need the championship. All they want is a better division. And how we're getting a better division is with them carrying everything on their back and spreading the wealth. So I think before we jump down Ember Moon's back, I know she means well here. I do. But I don't even know, and usually I know where they go. I'm glad I don't know because this is what we love about pro wrestling. Before we jump down Ember Moon's back, I honestly think we need to take a long, hard look as to why Sasha and Bayley are where they are right now with all the championships. And it's not because they legitimately don't give a shit about the division. I would be shocked if what I said here isn't 100% fact. One of the bigger stories to come out of WWE this week was the Big E singles push that started on Friday on SmackDown. Now, anybody that knows me knows that I am a stickler for logic. I hang my hat on things making sense week in and week out. All I want is a little bit of consistency. I want WWE to adopt momentum, consistency, wins and losses. I want them to adopt a mentality of what happens on the show matters. Not simply to put something on the show to fill a segment of two hours on TV. I don't want that. I don't think anybody wants that. That's what I hang my hat on every single week. You may not like that approach. You may think that I'm being a little too strict. You may think that I am being a little bit too critical of the product. But what do you want me to think? Do you want me to sit here and say that whatever WWE is doing right now and the way that they're operating and their mentality going into this show and that show and this pay-per-view and that pay-per-view is actually working? Is it making the shows better on a weekly basis? The answer is no. We need change. We need change. We need new superstars. We need young, youthful, up-and-coming superstars that will be the future of this company long after the Randy Ortons and the Seth Rollinses and the Big E's. I'm sorry, folks. Big E is not your answer. Everybody on Friday was already staking claim Big E is going to be the next WWE champion. Big E is going to be the next universal champion. How so? How so? Do you think it makes sense for Biggie to just be pushed in to a title program just because he's Biggie? Just because of the color of his skin? Because Kofi did it last year? I don't really understand your logic. How could you already be looking at a Biggie title run when you're in the middle of a Bray Wyatt title reign? We're not there yet, but he's inevitably taking that championship off of Braun Strowman at SummerSlam. We haven't even crowned our next WWE champion, which you all know that's going to be Bray. And you're already claiming it to be Big E or wanting it to be Big E. So I need you to take your Ember Moon mentality and I need you to not cry because you shouldn't get what you want yet. I'm not saying that he's never going to be a world champion. I'm just saying that there is a time and a place for everything. You know, you may not like what I say here, but WWE needs to push youth. WWE needs to push fresh, new, up-and-coming superstars as the face of the WWE, as the future of the WWE. I don't look at Big E being pushed as WWE's initiative to push new superstars. Big E is not a new superstar. Big E is a superstar who needs to work his way into a new role. But that doesn't make him a new superstar. He's not an Austin Theory. He's not an Adam Cole. He's not a Matt Riddle. He is a veteran guy being pushed in a new role. He is not the basis of pushing new superstars. And if you're going to claim that WWE's pushing new superstars while pushing Big E, you 
are the reason why the product is the way that it is right now. And you are the reason why they refuse to change. When Kofi Kingston was the WWE champion and when he was on his way to being WWE champion, I love the road that got Kofi Kingston to that WrestleMania match with Daniel Bryan. In some sense, in my honest opinion, that was the legitimate main event of WrestleMania that year. That was the best match of that particular WrestleMania. And after Kofi Kingston won the WWE Championship, what happened? What happened? WWE did their best to really ride the wave because they knew if they faltered in any which way, there would be online complaints because of who Kofi is and the nationality and the ethnicity of Kofi Kingston. Oh, WWE's against this guy and WWE's against that guy. WWE's racist. So they had to play their their storylines and they had to play the Kofi Kingston reign very, very carefully. And then, at the end of it all, it's almost as if nothing really mattered. Brock Lesnar came, and in seven seconds, Kofi Kingston wasn't the WWE champion anymore. Yes, it was fucked up, but I wasn't surprised that WWE went that route. But even though WWE tried to make Kofi look like a credible champion, AJ Styles and Seth Rollins and... Kevin Owens and another match with Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton, right? At the end of the day, Kofi Kingston was never taken to be a credible, serious world champion. When you look at Kofi Kingston, do you honestly look at WWE champion? I know I don't. I don't. And that was before the pancakes and the unicorns and the gyrating and the sexual innuendos. I didn't. But I learned to live with it because I love giving others an opportunity that they probably would never get. But when Kofi Kingston was champion, all of that still happened. The pancakes and the gyrating and the fucking unicorns and the homosexual jokes and this and that. You know? I didn't really like that. That's not what I look at when I look at WWE champion. When you are a WWE champion and when you are being placed in a WWE championship-like discussion, you have to act like a WWE champion. You have to feel like a WWE champion. Kofi Kingston wrestled like a WWE champion, but everything else that a WWE champion needs, Kofi didn't have. Now, I may be in the minority when I say that. You might be thinking that, oh, I don't agree with this guy. But that's what I look at when I see a WWE champion. I don't want my champion to be throwing fucking pancakes. I don't want my champion to be coming out dancing like, you know, some sissy wearing a unicorn on his head. I don't want it to be gyrating and making flamboyant jokes on commentary or on a promo. When Kofi did the serious thing, Kofi did it right. When the New Day does the serious thing, like example... When they were with the Usos, battling the Usos for the Tag Team Championship. You didn't see none of that shit with the Usos. Not the way the Usos were acting. That's the type of New Day that I want to see. I'm not saying you can't have the fun and games, but WWE seems to be all fun and games and, you know, not really enough serious. I didn't really take Kofi to be a WWE champion because we've seen all of that New Day shtick while he was champion. And I'm here to tell you guys that if Big E is going to have any, any WWE Championship run or Universal Championship run, that he cannot do the same thing that Kofi Kingston has done before in the past because we've seen it already. We've seen it already. And all it will do is bring people back to that. It will be rehashed. It will be redone. Nothing will be different. And it's going to come off more than... Just somebody who deserves it. It's going to be WWE buckling down and here's their next initiative. Here's their next political agenda. This propaganda piece of Big E because of what's going on right now and the world climate. And we're going to push this guy because he's going to be the face of that movement in our company. I don't really want that to happen because it's going to feel forced. If you're going to make Big E work, 
then Big E has to stand apart from the New Day and Big E has to be built organically. There needs to be something about Big E on television that resonates with the fan outside of what we've seen in the New Day. There needs to be a story in place, whether it's coming from behind, whether it's something completely made up to make him look better. Maybe it's an underdog story. Maybe it's the story of he can't coexist. Maybe he can't go out there and be on his own. Maybe he needs his help in the new day. Maybe he needs his brothers out there. That he can't do this by himself. Maybe he's jumping into a pool right now that he can't swim in. I don't know what it needs to be, but it cannot be modeled after Kofi Kingston. It can't. He can't be throwing pancakes. He can't be fucking rolling down the aisle way. He can't be coming out with all the fucking pretty colors and all the flamboyant colors. He can't be gyrating. He can't be making sexual innuendos on commentary or on the promos that he's cutting. I don't want to see that. If you're going to make Big E a WWE champion, he needs to be a WWE champion in every aspect of a WWE champion, not just in ring. Not just because you want Big E as a WWE champion or universal champion. Before we even put him in that role, he needs to fit the role. Before we put him in that role, it needs to be the right time for him to be in that role. Before we put him in that role, it needs to be in the ring with somebody who's going to complete him being in that role. Who that is, I don't know. I don't know. But the WWE cannot make the same mistake that they did with Kofi Kingston. I'm not the only one who thought and felt and looked at Kofi Kingston the way that I just mentioned to you here. There are a lot of people out there that felt the same way that I did. It had nothing to do with us not wanting him in that role. It has nothing to do with that. It's about the presentation. It's not about Kofi. It's about the presentation. They can't do the same thing with Biggie. Biggie needs to get some wins on television in a singles role. There needs to be a storyline arc in place for him, for people to believe in him. You just can't take Big E out of the New Day and put him in a title program with an AJ Styles or a Bray Wyatt or anybody that's a champion and move on with it. What are you doing? As far as I'm concerned, they already got off to the wrong foot. They were counterproductive on, on Friday night. It was in a match, a singles match, against a guy that's half of a tag team that the New Day have feuded with all year. So how are you going to get off on the right foot by putting him in the ring with The Miz, who he's feuded with and beat all year? All year, they beat down Miz and Morrison. And then you're going to take The Miz, who's a jobber in his own right, put him in the ring against Big E, and have The Miz on offense for 80% of the match while Big E makes a babyface comeback against a guy that we all know he could snap into. Not really the right way to go about it. Like I said, counterproductive. I don't know how anybody looked at that Friday Night Smackdown and said, man, Big E looked good in that effort. You're selling for The Miz? Oh, but The Miz is a WWE champion. Oh, The Miz is a multi-time champion. I don't give a fuck what champion he is. I don't give a shit how many championships he's held. He's a loser. The Miz has been portrayed as a loser on television. You don't produce a match like that against The Miz. That should have been five minutes tops. And Big E getting a solid road started with a big victory, a decisive victory over The Miz. Now, if you want to go and do what you did with The Miz on Friday with Big E, that's fine. But it's got to be the right guy. It's got to be a guy that's equal the size of Big E, that's stronger than Big E, that can handle Big E and throw Big E around like a Sheamus. Like a Sheamus. I would even take Baron Corbin in that instance. Or a Cesaro in that instance. But a Miz? You're going to give me the Miz versus Big E and then have a believable 15-minute match and everybody in the community, oh my God, that was a great effort. That was great storytelling. What? How are you even a fan at that point? I know from a, from a, a point of view uh, of me watching this show, I know you got to be a blithering idiot. You're not even watching the show the right way. 
You just willingly take everything that WWE does and thinks it's right. Big E needs a start. You can't take him and put him in a title match and call it a start. They already fucked up with Matt Riddle. Matt Riddle has already challenged AJ Styles twice. He won and then he lost. And now you're starting him where he should have started in the beginning. But you gave away the top tier match that everybody wanted to see coming on in already twice. Now you're putting him against Baron Corbin. So what makes you think that match with AJ Styles is going to really be that special the next time it happens for a third time? Make the big E road special. Give it meaning. Don't just take Big E because he's a part of the New Day and he's a staple in the WWE as a part of the New Day and put him in a position because he's a part of the fucking New Day. Now is the opportunity to extract him from the New Day and build him up as his own entity. And if you even want to think about breaking up the New Day, I wouldn't be opposed to that either. That could be a good storyline arc right there. Maybe Kofi Kingston setting Big E up for failure. Maybe him and Xavier have been talking behind Big E's back. Maybe the hacker gets involved. Maybe the hacker gets involved and Big E is on his own and Kofi and Xavier Woods have been spied on by the hacker if they want to bring him back to WWE television. And they are facilitating a breakup of the new day through this Big E singles run, which leaves him out there on his own Heartbroken that his brothers have betrayed him. And that's the story where he's got to come from behind because of the heartbreak that his brothers left him after seven years. He's on his own now. He can't do it without them. And he overcomes the odds and he's himself. That's what needs to happen. If you're going to tell me the same fucking story you told me with Kofi Kingston, save it. I don't want it. I don't want it. That opportunity then deserves to go to somebody else who is new, fresh, and different. Not a fucking Big E that we've seen for seven years at the top. I'm all for a big E push. I am. But it's got to be away from the new day. It's got to be away from the new day. It can't be what we see now. This is why I say I agree with Booker T. Now, I shit all over Booker T for his Naomi comments, but I'm not shitting on Booker T this week because this is what Booker T says in regards to what I just talked about. With Big E, he even said that Big E needs to shed some of the New Day elements for a singles run. First of all, Big E said about this new singles run, this kind of came out of nowhere. I feel confident that I am ready for this. The interesting thing and weird thing is we don't have that organic response. I hope people enjoy this run. I hope it's good and entertaining. I hope all the people who have clamored for this for years are not disappointed. What does that mean? I don't know. I don't know. People have been teasing the New Day's breakup for years now. Could that be what he's talking about? Do they have a plan in motion? But he said this is something that he didn't expect to happen now. It's been talked about, but he didn't expect it to happen now. It came out of nowhere. Booker T was on his Hall of Fame podcast with his host, Brad Gilmore. And he spoke about Biggie's upcoming singles run and some of the things that may need to be adjusted if he wants to become a top act in WWE. Big E in WWE is one of those guys that has all the tools. Booker T uh, agrees with it. Mick Foley even agreed with that. But need, things need to change. And this is what Booker T says, and I quote, I think Big E is going to have to shed some of the things in order for people to look at him as a world champion. The gear, maybe. Some forms of the gear, the colors. But then again, people say, oh, well, he shouldn't change anything. I'm not going to sit here and say, What's what? Because I don't want the internet going off saying, oh, Booker T saying he needs to do this and he needs to do that. I still think Big E trying to be the New Day is not going to work for him as far as working at the top of the card. I'm talking about being the main attraction. I'm talking about the guy in the company that has put himself in this position to be that guy. I don't think that's going to catapult him to that next level as far as still trying to be the New Day. You can't try and rehash something that you've been doing for so long and think that's what it's going to take you to the next level. I absolutely agree with him. Everything that I just said to you guys, that's exactly what Booker T is saying. There is a way to go about it. And if Booker T is saying this, then I know a lot of people are saying this because this is the same situation that people said when Kofi Kingston was champion. It's coming up again. 
If this needs to break up the new day, then so be it. Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods could still be the new day. Maybe they enlist a new member. The New Day is now a national act. The New Day is a brand all to itself. If you want to enlist somebody else in the New Day, then by all means, that's a spot that could be very coveted to make another new superstar. Meanwhile, you're breaking Biggie away and making him his own man and a top act in the company. So you're getting a two-for-one deal here. WWE has very interesting options to go in. They need to do it right. If Big E doesn't shed some of that New Day shit like Kofi should have done last year, I'm not going to be for it. I'm going to continue to reiterate my point of view here, and I'm not going to agree with WWE pushing Big E because at that point, it's going to be nothing more than a political agenda to fit the world climate in the WWE. It needs to be different. Have fun with it. The New Day has run its course. How many more tag team championships can they win and still feel special. There is no tag team division in WWE. Kofi had his run. Xavier is out. We don't know when he's coming back. If this breaks up the new day, then this may be the best time to do that. And if it's the case, to get Big E where he needs to be and tell a story about him being different on his own, fighting from behind, fighting from the heartbreak and winning it, then do it. That's what this needs, not rehashed from what Kofi did. Moving on here, man. AEW beat NXT in the ratings. Both were down, though, because of other sports taking place that very night. AEW drew 773,000 live viewers. NXT drew 707 live, or 707,000 live viewers. Last week, AEW drew 845, and NXT drew 615. So NXT was up, AEW was down. But like I said, MLB had started its season. You got the NBA back. You got NHL back. What's going to happen when football is back? Monday Night Raw is going to suffer from that greatly. So this was the first week that both shows had to go up against MLB games since COVID-19. Next week, they'll also deal with NBA and MLB on the same night. The viewership for AEW may take an increase because... There's a spoiler going around that Eric Bischoff is going to be the one moderating the Chris Jericho and Orange Cassidy face-to-face on Dynamite next week. Now, the show's already taped, so somebody obviously leaked the spoilers. Eric Bischoff is supposed to be on Dynamite next week. Now, this clearly has gotten people talking, oh, AEW is becoming TNA. Oh, AEW is picking up WWE scraps. So what? So what? We don't know what role Bischoff is going to play. We don't know if he's going to be on with the company full-time. Zack Ryder, a.k.a. Matt Cardona, isn't even with AEW full-time. As it's been reported, he's only signed on for a five-match deal. Maybe he wants to go and branch out and maybe do New Japan. Maybe go to Impact. Maybe do NWA if they start back up. Maybe do an MLW. I don't know. He's got the world by the balls. He can do whatever the fuck he wants. Let AEW run its business. You just like me. We watch and we enjoy. But they haven't done anything as of late where we should absolutely shit on the product creatively. Everything that they're doing right now has meaning. Everything that they're doing right now is generating interest. If Bischoff is going to simply moderate, then that's going to get my attention. And good for them. Good for them. Cody Rhodes even teased that it's going to be Guy Fieri which would be great because he's the king of the demos on Wednesday night with Guy's Grocery Games. That would be fucking great, man. I'd pop big time for that. So he teased with a picture of Guy Fieri on a recent tweet talking about Dynamite next week. But the spoiler was revealed that it should be Eric Bischoff. So we'll see what happens with that. NXT is obviously building towards TakeOver 30, Keith Lee and Karrion Cross there for the NXT Championship. The North American Championship will be determined in a ladder match. Right now, we got Dexter Loomis, and we have big man Bronson Reed already involved in this thing. Damian Priest more than likely will be involved in it. So we got some good stuff going on there. Undisputed Era and Imperium right now are battling for the Tag Team Championships. The Women's Championship will be determined. Dakota Kai and Rhea Ripley, they'll go one-on-one. 
to determine the number one contender for Io Shirai, which I'm assuming will take place at TakeOver. It doesn't make sense if Dakota Kai doesn't win it. Rhea Ripley's been involved in nothing. You've pushed Dakota Kai up and down, left and right for how many fucking months now? Give her the goddamn match. Rhea Ripley has done nothing. If you go and do Rhea Ripley, it's going to be WWE giving somebody that doesn't deserve it a title match that should not be the champion. At least Dakota Kai gives you that feel of she kind of deserves this match and she kind of deserves to be the champion as well. So we'll see what happens there. Other than that, I don't really know where else they go with TakeOver. I don't know where Champa fits in. I don't know where Gargano fits in. I don't know where Finn Balor fits in. We may get an Orny Lorcan and Timothy Thatcher stipulation match out of it. Being that Thatcher kind of cheated to beat Oni Lorcan the last time. They got some interesting things going on over there in NXT, but everybody's got all eyes on AEW because of All Out. We got the Hangman and Kenny Omega stuff going on with FTR, the Young Bucks. We don't know what's happening. We could be seeing a new formation of the Four Horsemen any week now. We don't know where Kenny lies. We don't know where Hangman lies. We got Cody and his situation with the TNT Championship. Nobody knows who's going to come out and challenge him. It could be Matt Cardona at All Out. We'll see. We got Darby Allin and Brian Cage. We got John Moxley and MJF for the AEW Championship. That unbelievable promo by MJF on Wednesday night was fantastic. So AEW's got some things going on for them, which in my eyes is more interesting than whatever AEW or NXT rather is doing. AEW has got the one up on NXT and it's just down to creative. I even read a report that NXT hired three or four more new creative writers to try and combat AEW. When has NXT ever needed more creative writers? Why? Why? NXT was the number one brand in all of North America. And the fact that you're going out and getting more creative writers just kind of spells it out to me that you are a desperate and you... You just can't handle it anymore with some competition. Again, where I ask, where is the old NXT that didn't need to do these makeshift shows to compete and didn't need to go out there and hire three or four more new creative writers to compete? They're really making themselves look weak. They really are. SmackDown, below 2 million. Even with two championship matches on Friday, SmackDown drew an average of 1.892 million viewers in the overnight. That's according to Showbuzz Daily. Hour one drew a 1.873. Hour two went up to 1.911. SmackDown also drew an average of a 0.5 rating in the 18 to 49 demographic, which was tied number one for the night with Shark Tank. If the number holds up, it would be down 1.7% in viewership from last week's Friday SmackDown, which drew an average of 1.924. And that was with a 0.5 rating in the 18 to 49 demographic. SmackDown was number eight for the night amongst networks in viewership. Came behind Shark Tank 2020 Greatest at Home Videos, which is some more uh, pandemic propaganda. Magnum PI, Blue Bloods, The Wall, Dateline NBC. Greatest at Home Videos topped the night with 3.276 million viewers. There, that's sad. That's fucking sad, man. I can't watch those shows, man. If there's one thing that's going to generate depression in somebody, watch those shows. And this number may even be worse when the real rating comes out on Monday. Usually the overnight's a little bit higher and the real rating shows an even downward trend. So WWE could be looking at a worse rating than the 1.892 million overnight rating. So I'll keep you guys posted on that on next week's show if you even care at this point. They're still below 2 million on Friday night, which has to be looked at as a fucking disappointment and a failure if you are Fox and Fox management. Simple. Kyrie Sane. This was the other big thing that I wanted to talk about earlier in the week, but I saved it for this. Kyrie Sane was taking major criticism for her goodbye tweet on Raw on Monday. WWE wrote Kyrie Sane out of the current storyline on Monday Night Raw because her contract is up and she's headed back to Japan to maybe wrestle and spend time with her family, wanting to be closer to her husband. Now, her time in WWE is over. She decided to say goodbye to fans and her WWE family. And what's catching attention and drawing some heat is when she posted that goodbye tweet. Now, if you looked at this tweet, more than likely you didn't see anything major. Okay? 
Now, if you're somebody like a wrestling purist, a wrestling enthusiast, or if you're the shills on Busted Open Radio, then you might have had an issue with this. Now, the timing of her tweet seems to be the real issue here, not what she said. The timing of her tweet seems to be the real issue. No one seems to be taking an issue that Kyrie Sane said goodbye. Her touching post on social media thanked everyone for the last three years, the great people she met, and how everyone took care of her. And that happened to be both in front of camera and behind the camera. It's great to see her happy and happy with what she accomplished in WWE. That's fine. Nobody has a problem with that. It's the timing of her tweet that is the real issue with a lot of people. Now, Kyrie Saint's tweet was literally posted three minutes after she took a beating from Bailey that helped Sasha Banks win the Raw Women's Championship. The tweet didn't mention the segment on Raw or the fact that she was apparently injured as per the show. And from reading it, you would never know that Saint was trying to sell the beating. That's what rubbed people the wrong way. Now, Busted Open Radio, Bully Ray actually had a problem with this. I believe Dave LaGreca had a problem with this as well. And they discussed how Sane didn't sell the segment and said it showed a total lack of respect to all the women that worked so hard to make that segment believable. Specifically, Bailey, who now looks weak, and Asuka, who treated the moment as though Sane's injuries were overwhelming. After all, Asuka probably wouldn't have bailed on the Raw Women's Championship if Sane wasn't really all that hurt. This isn't to say that either Bailey or Oscar have an issue, more that those arguing it was a mistake by saying to post it feel bad for the two superstars left to try and make the storyline work now. The debate is that the tweet screams that wrestling is fake. While everyone knows that the entertainment product is scripted and predetermined, some of you might have actually realized that the show was taped and that Kyrie in that moment wasn't really Kyrie in that moment. She was actually home with us watching the show. Completely ignoring what was done on television less than five minutes before her tweet was posted undersells everything that happened. There is a level of respect for the business there that Sane completely ignored. At the same time, there are no secrets in wrestling these days and fans have had the curtain pulled back for years now. Is this really a big deal? That's the question being posed. Is it really a big deal? One thing for sure, considering how the show was taped and she probably was watching at home like I just mentioned... You'd think that she would have waited a few hours or even a day. Even 48 hours later, that post wouldn't have bothered so many people. I don't really agree with anything on Busted Open Radio. I think I think their opinion is very, very one-sided, and that's the WWE side. Rarely do they openly criticize anything. You know, it's always pro-WWE on that, on that podcast. But... I'm going to have to actually agree with them here. This is just a lack of attention to detail. Now, I, I complained about why didn't Bailey grab a cameraman? Who the fuck showed that thing on the big screen? Who hit the button for that scene to be shown during the match? It doesn't make any sense. Bailey should have grabbed the cameraman, had beaten down Kari just a little bit ago before that so she couldn't move, and grabbed the cameraman and showed the beat down, and then it would have made a lot more sense. It would have been tightened up a little bit. This is all for the attention to detail that just seemingly goes ignored in WWE. Now, Kyrie probably wasn't even thinking about that. She was just watching this and just kind of saying, you know what, this was my last night. I want to say goodbye to everybody. Everybody's watching the show. Everybody's watching the segment. It's probably best to get this out immediately after everybody's on a high watching that segment. I get it. I get it, but it's... Such a small detail that really does take away from the impact of the angle. It really makes Asuka look fucking stupid. Kyrie Sane wasn't in a life or death situation like Ember Moon stated. So why did she get up and leave and risk losing the women's championship to go and save Kyrie Sane? And how injured could Kyrie Sane be if literally three minutes after the segment was ended, she's tweeting out wishing everybody goodbye? Shouldn't you be on a fucking doctor's table somewhere? Shouldn't you be attended to by medical staff somewhere? Why are you on your phone? I get it. It makes everybody look weak in that segment. It makes Asuka look even more stupid for doing what she did. WWE should have all their bases covered. This is why you have so many fucking people 
writing this show? How does something like that go ignored? I know if I'm running a wrestling company, you're going to have your people in charge of the segment, making sure that's right. And then you're going to have people in charge of social media, making sure that nothing like this is said. If this was said even the next day, that, mo- that Tuesday morning, it wouldn't have been a deal at all. You should have sold the attack. You ain't going back to WWE. Everybody knows that you've been written off TV. doesn't matter if you said it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, even today. She wanted to capitalize on the height of the segment. That's why she put it out. But in return, she did more damage than anybody could have realized. Is WWE going to make light of this? Probably not. Does WWE care about this? Probably not. It fits right into their MO. But it makes Asuka look stupid, even more stupid for doing what she did. Because Kyrie now, if she's so hurt, badly hurt, why the fuck is she tweeting? And why did she give up the Raw Women's Championship to go help you if you are out there three minutes after the thing is over, tweeting out goodbye to everybody? Unreal. I agree with Bully Ray and Dave LaGreca and Busted Open Radio on this taking away from the overall impact that that storyline segment put in place. Rey Mysterio's contract update. I got an update on Rey Mysterio. Mysterio met with Vince McMahon last week in Stanford, Connecticut at WWE headquarters, Titan Tower. Mysterio wants a raise, but McMahon was unwilling to pay him more on a new deal because they are in cost-cutting mode because of the pandemic. I'm sure Rey Mysterio has an eagle eye on the money that WWE made. They were projected to make somewhere between, I believe it was 12 and 15 million for the quarter, and they garnered almost 50 So, yes, please, let me hear about Rey Mysterio just saying, you know what, keep your money. Let me see Vince McMahon tell Rey Mysterio, yeah, we can't give out raises. Meanwhile, look how much money you're making with the PC shows and during the pandemic, and Rey Mysterio wants a little bit of a raise to work for you, and you're not willing to give Rey Mysterio a little fucking raise to work for you? Is he worth it? Or is he one of those guys that you're willing to let walk and go to AEW? Because that's exactly where he's going to end up. And then we'll have the fucking shills and all the fucking marks on social media. I'm looking at AEW picking up another WWE reject. Because you'd let Rey Mysterio just walk, right? He wouldn't sign Rey Mysterio if he was a free agent, you fucking imbecile. Give me a break. Apparently a deal was not reached in Titan Tower last week. Noted on The Observer. Mysterio has yet to sign a new deal. He was not on Monday's Raw, but his son Dominic was there. And they continue to push the angle with Seth Rollins and Buddy Murphy. It is unknown if Dominic has signed a new contract or a contract or a short-term one. But based on how things played out on Monday, it looks like they're building towards Dominic and Seth Rollins, which leads me to Dominic's plan at SummerSlam. Sports Kita has revealed the latest on Dominic Mysterio. And there seems to be plans for Dominic to team up with his father to face Buddy Murphy and Seth Rollins at SummerSlam. However, those plans hinge on whether or not Rey Mysterio signs a new WWE deal. They say this, and I quote, The Mysterios vs. Rollins and Murphy feud is really up in the air at the moment. It is currently on the SummerSlam agenda to have Rey and Dominic against Seth Rollins and Murphy. However, that really depends on if Rey signs a new deal. It is also possible that we could see Dominic versus Seth Rollins in a singles match, but that would be done as a way to convince Rey by saying that here we're pushing your son. So that's what they say on their website. Uh, A tag team match with father and son against Rollins and Murphy or a singles match against Rollins at SummerSlam would be uh, both very good debuts for Dominic. I know Rey Mysterio wants the tag team match with his son more so than the singles match with Dominic and Seth Rollins. So we don't know which one of them is going to happen, but one of them calls for at least one of them. Or the plans call for at least one of them to happen at SummerSlam. Again, again, I don't know what happens here. I don't know how longer this storyline can go on and continue. Ray lost his eye. Apparently, he'll be good to go by SummerSlam. According to the uh, update, the medical update that they gave on Ray Mysterio, his vision will be intact. Is it going to be enough to get him at SummerSlam? I don't know. I don't know. We don't really need that to happen. It could happen. It could happen. And it could play into the storyline that I had originally pitched, or originally pitched, where it would be Seth Rollins and Buddy Murphy in a tag team match against Dominic and Rey Mysterio. And being that Rollins is already taking care of Rey Mysterio, you know, 
it would make more sense now than ever, being that they did the eye for an eye match, to put Dominic on the line. Clearly, Ray is a failure. He couldn't get the job done. Now you want to fight me with your son? Here's the deal. If you can't beat me, your son now works for me. And then Dominic joins the greater good. And how Ray gets him out of that situation, I don't know. Maybe that's where we see Aleister Black. Maybe that's where we see Aleister Black. And maybe even at that point, if Aleister Black is going to be reworked and repackaged, maybe Aleister Black comes back and tries to help Rey Mysterio, but then ultimately turns heel on Rey Mysterio. He joins the greater good. And then Dominic is one of those individuals where he's going to come to his senses and realize that this is not the case. And maybe weave that into the storyline somehow. I don't know. I don't know. But the beginning stages of this should call for Dominic to join the greater good. That's what needs to happen. How you get there, I don't know. But it looks like we're getting some sort of the Mysterios versus Rollins and Murphy at SummerSlam, whether it's Dominic versus Rollins or Dominic and Ray versus Rollins and Murphy. We don't know yet. We will find out as these shows obviously will be taped on Monday. WWE's taping two Raws on Monday. And then they will continue on with the rest of their programming during next week. Finally, guys, I'm going to end with this. There was a rumor about the new nation of domination being on TV. Led by MVP, Shelton Benjamin, and Bobby Lashley. Ron Simmons was on Raw. That was because they were planting the seeds for it to happen. Mark Henry was also set to appear on Raw to get the angle going. Henry appeared backstage during Raw this week, and he had no interaction with MVP at all. Ron Simmons wasn't even on the show. Henry was seen talking to Drew McIntyre instead of getting his new uh, stable started. So Mark Henry didn't factor into anything Nation of Domination related. Now, during Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave Meltzer confirmed that a revamped Nation of Domination stable is not happening at all now. They decided to go in a different direction, but WWE still needed to figure out a reason for Mark Henry to be on television since he made the trip to Orlando. The deal with Mark Henry is that, and Melcher says this, the deal with Mark Henry is that you know Mark Henry and Ron Simmons were brought into these tapings for the Nation of Domination angle that they scrapped. So I guess they figured that since Mark Henry is there, where you know they put him on TV for no apparent reason other than he's here, let's put him on TV. MVP then responded while he was on Post Wrestling's podcast and said this about the Nation of Domination. No, no, short answer is no. Because I've been hearing the chatter and I've been seeing that and I don't want to do the new anything. The nation was done. It was awesome in that time that it was done. It was needed. Stars were made. I don't want to rehash something else. I want to bring something new. I don't necessarily, in our approach to the Hurt Business, me and Bobby, as you know, are legitimate friends away from wrestling. We boys. Shelton is one of my closest friends. I just like making money with my friends. You know what I'm saying. And I see young, talented guys. I asked to work with Apollo. I said, give him, give me him. Let me work with him. I know we can get it out of him. He's got it. He's tremendously talented. He just needs a little coaxing. He just needs a little help, some, some understanding. And me and Apollo, we'll work on things together. We'll have conversations before certain segments, and he's coachable. That's why he's been successful. I wouldn't know about, I don't know about him being success, successful, but, I mean, he's on TV. I guess that counts for something, right? Now, I've always wanted to work with Ricochet. Ricochet's been one of my all-time favorite dudes for years. I used to tell him, if you could talk like you wrestle, you'd be a millionaire. So there you go. Everybody that says Ricochet can't cut a promo, even MVP thinks so. I used to tell him that all the time. And now, unfortunately, I also tell him all the time. Now, at this stage of my career, I can't have the kind of match that I'd like to have with you. But we can still have a great match just because of my veteranship and understanding of how things go. But... I have no interest in rehashing the Nation of Domination, and while I do want to present myself and Bobby and Shelton as strong black role models, successful businessmen, we're businessmen. We're not going to try and make a statement on race. We're trying to make a statement, period. And in our case, what we're trying to do, it's not about black or white. It's not about gold or green. And at that point, I love the fact that we're young men, or that there are young men of color that can watch us and go, oh, I want to be like them because... When I was a kid, I used to want to be like Rocky Johnson and like Tony Atlas. Man, when I grow up, I want to look like that. I want to be like them. So the political climate clearly doesn't call for it. I don't really need to go into reasons why. You guys should know that by now. 
But the main thing here that I took away from this is that MVP said exactly what I said last week when it comes to the nation of domination. Why are you going to rehash something that was done the right way then, that fit the time period then to fit it now, and it's not going to fit now? Why are you going to rehash something that is never going to be anywhere close to what the, to what the original is? People will automatically put it down if you do it again. For obvious reasons, one, and obvious, the other reason is that it's nowhere going to be close to what Farouk did, what D'Lo Brown did, what Mark Henry did, and what Dwayne Johnson did. You don't have the level of superstar here that would even come close in the same breath to match the level of superstar that was that nation of domination. So why even bother? You're setting them up for failure if you're going to go and recreate something that is not going to be anywhere close to what the, to, to what the original was going to bring to you. Nothing. So that's what I got out of that. And I'm glad he put his foot down. And I'm glad they canceled the whole gimmick or the idea of it. They don't need to be the nation. They need to be the hurt business. They need to be and create something new for WWE television and get who they have on the show right now over. Genuinely. Not because you're going to revive a group that was beloved in the day. It's not going to be the same thing now. Guys, I'm getting out of here. Thank you so very much for all your support on the podcast. If you enjoyed it, hit that thumbs up. Let me know what you think down below. Hit that subscribe button down below as well. Turn on that bell for all notifications. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206 is the Patreon if you guys want to support. Make sure you check out all the other videos if you missed anything on the channel this week. AudibleTrial.com slash off the script. Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. And keep an eye out for the new shirt going live tomorrow at noon. Bonfire.com. Follow me on Twitter for all the details. Pay attention to the Instagram for all the details. It will be live tomorrow noon. Go and get your t-shirt as it goes live. And let's make it bigger and better than the original. Guys, I'm getting out of here. I'll see you for some extras tomorrow. I'll see you for Monday Night Raw tomorrow night. Until then, thank you for another great week of content. We are right back on track doing what we do best here on OTS and bringing you the best in the IWC. Until then, guys, take care. Again, hit that thumbs up, and I'll see you right back here on Monday with a brand new week of content on Off The Script. I'll see you later.